Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started so we can get back on track. I'm Elizabeth Bass. I'm the Director of Publications and the Editor of the Chronicles of Oklahoma here at the Oklahoma Historical Society. We are so excited to have you here today for the Oklahoma History Symposium, Perspectives in History. Our first presenter today is OHS Executive Director Trait Thompson. Trait Thompson took up the mantle as OHS Executive Director in January 2021. He earned his bachelor's degree from Oral Roberts University and a master's in public administration from the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. Thompson began his career with the state of Oklahoma as policy director for former Oklahoma Senate Pro Tem, sorry, excuse me, Senate President Pro Tem Brian Bingman. During that four-year service, Thompson read every bill submitted to the Senate, met with citizens from across the state, and learned how to work with others to achieve shared goals. For the six years prior to being named OHS Executive Director, he was the project manager for the Oklahoma Capital Restoration Project, shepherding the preservation and restoration of one of Oklahoma's most important historical artifacts, the state capitol. Trait will now give us an overview of the history of the building and the restoration process. Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. I know I'm not the person that uh, you probably saw when you signed up for the symposium, but uh, I'm always happy to pinch hit. I told, uh, I told uh, the staff that uh, I've always got this capital presentation ready to go at a moment's notice. So I'm very thrilled to be able to talk a little bit about the history of the state capital and talk about the restoration project that I spent a good chunk of the last six or seven years working on. And uh, I will say this, though, you know, uh, one of my favorite stories, I read Robert Dorman's book about uh, Alfalfa Bill Murray a year or so ago, and that was a really good book. And one of the stories that I thought was so incredible about Cape Bernard is in the very first legislative session when Alfalfa Bill was Speaker of the House, uh, Kate uh, Bernard had been hounding him to get a bill passed regarding ch child labor. And it didn't end up passing, and she took that as a personal slight. And so as he was trying to run for governor to succeed Charles Haskell, she pretty much followed him all the way around the state. And every time he had a stump speech, she would come up right behind him and just basically castigating and talk, call him all the worst things in the world and criticize him for not getting that child labor law passed. And she's credited for, for him not becoming governor during that uh, election right after Charles Haskell. And it just talks about, to me, it just illustrates the kind of force of nature that Kate Bernard was. And uh, I, I do believe that she does not get enough credit, particularly here in our state, for all the things that she did accomplish. So that's a little aside that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about today, except for the fact that if you go to the state capitol, there is a bronze sculpture of Kate Bernard on the first floor of her sitting on a bench. And uh, it's, uh, it's fairly prominent there on the first floor. And if you haven't seen it, you should go see it. A lot of times people sit there and they pose for pictures sitting on the bench next to Kate. So um, go check that out if you have a chance to do it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the state capitol. And uh, like I said, this is something that I've spent a lot of time researching. I think at, at last count I had about 320 pages of notes on the state capitol. So uh, it's something that I've delved into quite a bit over the last few years. But you can't talk about the building of the Capitol without getting into a little bit of the history. This is one of my favorite quotes I've run across about the Capitol. It's safe to, to guess that the building will be there when this and several other generations have gone, unless it is attacked by zeppelins. And I do not think there is much danger of that. And to, <laughs> to me, that just illustrates that sometimes the concerns that they had in 1915 were a little bit different than our concerns today. I think that uh, Mr. Leecraft, who was the author of that quote, was very, uh, was very uh, prescient. There was no danger of it getting attacked by Zeppelin. A so. little bit about the timeline of the capital. So as you're probably aware, the original state capital city was in Guthrie, Oklahoma. 1906, the Enabling Act established Guthrie as the state capital uh, for until 1913. And so most of the folks in Guthrie thought they had a pretty good hold on having the capital city there. Well, unfortunately, Guth Guthrie uh, is a Republican town, and we have a very, very Democrat state. 
at that particular period in time. And Charles Haskell, the governor, got tired of getting attacked by Frank Greer, the publisher of the newspaper there in Guthrie. And he said, you know what, we can take care of this. There's a little city down about 20, 30 miles south of here that is growing like wildfire. And so we'll see if we can't just move the capital. So they got an initiative petition together, got enough signatures on the petition, and then uh, we all, or this, all the citizens of Oklahoma at the time, had a, had a chance to vote on whether or not the capital would be Guthrie, Shawnee, or Oklahoma City. Now, the election was set for June the 11th, 1910, and that's a peculiar date because that's a Saturday, and we don't often have statewide elections that are on a Saturday, and that was a little bit of shenanigans because uh, the election was set for the following Tuesday, but Charles Haskell scratched out the date and said we were going to have it on a Saturday. And the reason for that, he thought that would give, uh, prevent the folks from Guthrie from going the very next day because it's Sunday, all the courts are closed and filing a lawsuit. Well, Guthrie ended up filing a lawsuit anyway, and the results of the election were tossed out on a technicality. They didn't draft the language in the uh, initiative petition correctly the first time around. But that didn't stop, so the night of the election, June 11, 1910, uh, Charles Haskell calls his personal secretary, W.B. Anthony. He says, we're moving the state capital. W.B. Anthony, in that saga, was the state seal stolen? Was it not stolen? Who knows? It's a big legend. If you go to the courthouse in Guthrie today, there's a monument out there that was put up in the 50s that says state seal stolen. So we're not going to dive too much into that saga right now. But... Uh, the seal is retrieved, comes to the Lee Huckins Hotel. They paste a poster on one of the doors there and said, Governor's Office, this is the new state capital. Well, that election was thrown out on a technicality, so Oklahoma is a little bit in limbo. Where is the state capital? The, the court stayed in Guthrie just to be safe. And uh, in, uh, in December of 1910, the legislature gets together. They actually meet at the Lee Huckins Hotel in the Levy Building here in Oklahoma City. Unfortunately, both those buildings are no longer with us thanks to urban renewal, but um, they meet it in downtown Oklahoma City and they pass legislation that establishes the state capital right across the street on land that was owned by the Harn and the Culbertson families as the new location of the state capital. Folks in Guthrie were not ready to quite give up the fight yet, so they get another initiative petition together. There's another election in 19, uh, 1912 that says uh, that they want to pick again, Guthrie, Shawnee, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City wins again, and that really sets the stage for us to build our state capital. So who are the key players in building our state capital? Well, first of all, we have the Capital Building Commission. This was the commission that was established uh, first under uh, Haskell and then Lee Cruz as the uh, group that's going to oversee the building of the capital. They hire Leighton and Smith. Solomon Leighton is the architect very prominent Oklahoma architect at the time, designed numerous buildings all across the state, and most prominently courthouses and schools at that particular period. Uh, he's famous for, if you know, the Bizzle Library on the OU campus. If you know the Skirvin Hotel, of course, he designed that. He has a, about 40 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places currently. So he's the designer of the Capitol. James Stewart and Company, uh, based out of New York, is the contractor on the Capitol, and they had built the Idaho and the Utah capitals prior to this uh, before. Governor Robert Williams comes in in 1915. He establishes himself as the head of the Capitol Building Commission. And he really was, he wasn't just a figurehead. He was deeply involved in the intimate details of the building of the Capitol and a force to be reckoned with on every minor detail that would have come up. Edward P. Boyd was borrowed from the federal government. They actually, Governor Cruz sent a letter to Woodrow Wilson and said, hey, this guy you've got building a federal courthouse and the post office here, we like him a lot. We want to bring him on to make sure that we're getting our money's worth for our state capital and make him the superintendent. And uh, Woodrow Wilson said yes, and so Edward Boyd came on and, and helped manage the project from the state's perspective, later went on to be the dean of the Ag our architecture department at OSU, which was then known as Oklahoma A&M University. The groundbreaking was July the 20th of 1914, and uh, Governor Cruz uh, swung his silver-plated pickaxe into the ground, and now uh, we broke ground on the Capitol. Uh, by the way, that silver-plated pickaxe is now on display at the State Capitol Museum. Little plug to go over there and check that out when you have a chance. 
Uh, about 5,000 people attended this ceremony. This is one of my favorite quotes. Governor Cruz said, this is not a time for speech ma making, but a time for work. Talking may be all right in arranging and planning for a state capital, but talking never built a state capital, never will, but subsequently went on to make a really long speech. So. <laughs> And you know that because it was put, they, at that time they published all the speeches of that day in the Daily Oklahoma, and it was a really long speech. So, <laughs> Here's uh, construction progress on the state capitol. So for the first about 15 months of the capitol project, they had not hired James Stewart and company yet, so the Capitol Building Commission managed all of the work on the state capitol. And so they hired day laborers, which you can see uh, right Right here, they took this picture in 1915, April of 1915, in fact. And so uh, they managed that process, building the structure all the way up to the mezzanine level. Now, one thing that's interesting about our particular capital, the structure for our capital was concrete and not steel. What's interesting is concrete was just coming into use as a structural building material in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, the first structural concrete building to be built in the world was in 1903, and that was the Harvard football stadium. And people were still a little bit suspect about whether or not that was actually going to stand up. So the architects, to make a point, during the first football game, went down into the bowels of the stadium and stayed there the whole game just to put their money where their mouth was and to say, we have trust that this building is going to hold up. So by the time we get to 1915, 1916, we're building a, a concrete structure building. And for a while, uh, the rumor is, is that we had the largest concrete frame infrastructure building in the world. I have not found anything to verify that, but since I haven't found anything not to verify it, I'm gonna go ahead and say that that was true. One thing they did do is they built a railroad spur off the, the railroad line that still runs out here uh, uh, through 21st or, or 23rd Street. You can see that line right there. So all of those materials that they used in the construction of the building, they were able to bring up right up to the base of the building uh, via a railroad line. Um, one thing I always like to get into is the dome. Uh, there are some myths about the dome that I like to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, go ahead and dispel when I have the chance to do that. The two myths that I hear most often, the first one is, is that they ran out of money and that's why they didn't put the dome on the building. The second one is, is that they did not have materials available due to World War II. Those two myths are actually not true. At early, early in the process, as early as 1914, when they started the project, they had determined that they, would not gonna, they were not gonna put the dome on the building. The dome would have cost between $250,000 and $500,000 depending on the materials that they would have used to construct the dome. Well, the budget for the capital was $1.5 million. So they did, not have the, uh, they did not have the money to put on something that they viewed as ornamental at that time. Thankfully, though, the legislature said, we want to put the structure in place to be able to handle the weight of the dome should future generations decide they want to come on and bring one on. I don't think that they, they thought that it would take 85 years to get one on, uh, but, but they went ahead and did that. Once again, Governor Williams, who, uh, who was really managing the project, said, uh, I don't, I'm not necessarily against the idea of the dome, but that $250,000 we could use for other things. And one of the things he suggested was starting the University Hospital, which is now OU Hospital, just down the street from here. These are the original drawings uh, from Solomon Layton and his team in the, uh, that we have here in the archives at the Oklahoma Historical Society on the dome and so in 2001-2002 when they put the dome on the building they went ahead and they consulted these original drawings in designing what the look of our dome would look like. Completed capital June 30th of 1917 about two months ahead of schedule and uh, on a 1.5 million dollar budget. Now today we could lose 1.5 million dollars in the couch cushions at the Capitol but back in 1917 <laughs> that built you a pretty nice uh, pretty nice building over there. There were only three floors authorized in statute uh, because they you know wanted they had two competing goals and by they I mean the legislature. They wanted a building big enough to put all of state government under that one roof. They were tired of paying rent in all these various buildings in downtown Oklahoma City but they also didn't want to climb a lot of stairs. So they said it can only be three floors. Well, it's actually a six floor building. So what they did is they called, uh, they called what we call today the ground floor, they called that the sub-basement. The first floor they called the basement, second floor the first floor, third floor the mezzanine, fourth floor the second floor, third floor 
uh, fifth floor, the third floor, sixth floor, the attic. So only three floors in the Capitol building. So <laughs> where there's a will, there's a way, I suppose. Uh, the materials in the building, most of the exterior is Indiana gray limestone. Uh, they had talked about using uh, marble at one point. They had talked about using granite that was quarried in Oklahoma. Uh, ultimately, because of cost, they ultimately went with Indiana limestone. That limestone was carved in Indiana, brought here on train car, and then placed in. The first two levels of the capital are Tishomingo red granite from a quarry called Ten Acre Rock near Tishomingo or Troy, Oklahoma. And that uh, was quarried, brought on site, it was carved on site, and then put into place. The floors are Alabama marble. Well, the reason those are Alabama marble, they were going to do terrazzo flooring, but the folks in Alabama really wanted their marble in the, the capital, so they cut us a deal. So it was actually pretty cost effective to be able to add Alabama marble into the building. Wall bases and stairways were Vermont marble. Walls were hollow tile covered with plaster, even though originally they wanted to have limestone walls all throughout the building. There was an internal vacuum cleaner system put in, which uh, I forget, the, who was the lady I talked to about the Marlin Grand Home just a few minutes ago? Um, might not be in here right now, but anyway, uh, the Marlin Grand Home, which was also designed by Solomon Layton about the same time as this building, also had the internal vacuum cleaner system. So I think Solomon Layton was a little bit enamored by this new technology uh, because he did put it in the Capitol as well. There were elevators in the Capitol originally, uh, stained glass skylights, ornamental plaster ceilings, the big, beautiful marble staircase that goes from the second floor to the fourth floor. And then uh, the railing around the second floor oculus is not marble, it's actually alabaster that was quarried in northwestern Oklahoma. So I'm going to hit on some of the restoration. Really, I want to, in the time that I have left, I want to show you some before and after pictures and talk just briefly about uh, some of the work. This is a presentation that I think I did a few weeks ago that went for an hour and 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm cutting it down just a little bit for you guys today. So on the exterior, you can see some of the problems that we were dealing with. No mortar in the mortar joints, mortar falling out, water getting in by, and behind the stone, original steel windows that were rusted and in terrible shape. You can see that you needed a canoe to get through the tunnel uh, over here. Just everything that was can't, just on the exterior, just think water infiltration, and that's our big problem all the way around the building. Uh, our team that worked on it, uh, uh, J.E. Dunn Construction, had done the capital restoration projects in Kansas, Wyoming, and Minnesota, done historic buildings all over the country, really showed their chops with being able to do a historic restoration project, and that's why they ended up uh, getting the bid there. And Those are some of the people that worked with them. I will say Mark One Restoration out of Chicago did all the stone restoration work. And what was so fun is that as you were walking the scaffolding, on most construction sites you expect to hear Spanish being spoken, but on our, that construction site it was all Polish. They were all Polish stonemasons who were working on that, which was pretty fun. Our scope of work, all 12 elevations of the Capitol were scaffolded, not all at one time. Uh, we did over 4,600 stone repairs. We were pointed over 21 miles of mortar joints all the way around the building, cleaned all the limestone and granite surfaces. All 477 original steel frame windows were restored. Doors, stair railings, the tunnel was dug up and waterproof, on and on there. Uh, here's some of the photos from the uh, stone repair project. I remember watching these guys. You know, in some cases, we only had to repair a small part of the stone. You'd cut out the damaged part, you put in a new piece of stone in what's called a Dutchman repair. But in some cases, we had to get giant pieces of new limestone up on the building because the originals were so damaged. And these guys wielded those into place like they were lifting a piece of paper. I mean, it was incredible to watch the skill and the craftsmanship that they had. Um, ornamental stone repair, we did some carving, so if we had some of the damage of the ornamental stone, you can see here they would cut out the, the damaged part, then they would make a template that you see here. They would attach the new piece of stone in, which by the way, we went back to the original quarry area in Indiana to get the new stone for the building, so it would match the best. And then you see our stonemasons would carve it up until it matched exactly what was there before, before it was damaged. The window repair, the windows were probably some of the most difficult uh, part of the entire project to work on. First of all, because we had to do lead paint abatement, which is why you see this guy in this full suit here. And then we had to ship parts off to Kansas City and then restore the rest of the structure of the window in place. And each window took about six months to restore. It was a very intensive 
project. Of course, we didn't do one window at a time, but still. Uh, the historic main entrance, we've got these beautiful pocket doors on the front side of the building that had not been operational for quite some time. So those were completely restored. We added bird netting. Uh, we, did, we sealed them all up so that they were safe from water infiltration. All of the exterior and interior historic lighting was completely restored by St. Louis Antique Lighting out of, out of St. Louis. Uh, just incredible job. And what you can see here, you see these, some of these original parts and pieces for the fixture were missing and had been missing for years. And they were able to recreate those to make our light fixtures whole. The tunnel, as I mentioned, one of the most difficult projects also. We had to dig up the tunnel, re-waterproof it. You can see what it looked like before. And then we completely redid the interior. It was a terrible way to enter the Capitol before. And now it's come back to life. And it's a beautiful way. And you don't have to wade through water, which is a bonus. <laughs> the copper roof had to be replaced. And uh, this was uh, one of the projects that was what those two words, unforeseen circumstances. We didn't originally think we would need to replace the roof. But we ended up having to do that because it was in worse shape than we thought it was. And so you can see the, the work that went into that. Why did we use copper? A, it was the historic building material that was on there. B, it's a very durable roof. A, a properly maintained copper roof will last about 80 years on the building. I should take, the, take a moment to mention, too, our mantra on this project was no Band-Aids. We did not want to do anything on this project where we would create a problem for someone else. So in everything, we endeavored to do very long-lasting uh, work here. I get to the interior restoration, you can see what we were dealing with here. They glued carpet over historic marble, drop-in ceilings over historic bare vaulted ceilings. This is what the original plumbing looked like here. Isn't that wonderful? So we had to go through, and really, I'll tell you this from the, from the mo from, uh, just to set the foundation. The Capitol is a historic, beautiful 1917 building. Today, as it sits, the guts that make the Capitol run, plumbing, Electrical, mechanical, life safety, data cabling is now all completely replaced, all completely modern 21st century. This is our interior team of people who worked on the project. Manhattan Construction won the bid on that. And uh, they did a fabulous job along with their partners, FSB architects and engineers. Our scope of work, really it was to get the building functional again from an infrastructure perspective, but then we also wanted to restore the historic interior. This is some of the infrastructure work that we did. You know, you can, this was a brand new uh, modern electrical generator. We added new electrical system all throughout the building, new heat pumps. For the first time, we climate controlled the interior of the Capitol and the public spaces. It had never been climate controlled before. In fact, I had to laugh in 2018 when they had the big teacher rallies up at the Capitol and uh, so many teachers in and I heard, heard people talking about they turn off the air conditioner to make it uncomfortable for us so that we would leave the building and we had to tell them there's no air conditioning in here. It had never been air conditioned that way. Um, this is some of the work that we did on the ground floor west wing. So one of the big things we did is the ground floor became a primary public entrance floor for the building. And so we wanted to get those corridors wide. We wanted to get those corridors tall so that it would be a proper public area. So a lot of all the utilities we put underneath the floor so that they weren't running above the ceiling anymore. This is before what that corridor looked like coming from the west side of the building. A lot of people have described that to me as 1950s hospital. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. The Supreme Court building, we had Justice Cogger here just a few minutes ago, uh, but the Supreme Court room, uh, really, we did a lot of loving restoration in that room. So this is the original mahogany bench that was completely restored. We went in with a new paint scheme. We, re we restored all the plaster in there, new carpet, uh, all those kinds of things. But probably my favorite thing we did in there is we were able to find enough parts and pieces from the original light fixtures to go back and replicate those original fixtures. And so we have brought this room back into what it would have looked like back in 1917. The Blue Room. Uh, the Blue Room offered us quite an opportunity. It's a ceremonial room that the governor uses for bill signings or for press conferences or meeting with dignitaries. Uh, you can see before, really all that was blue is, of course, the carpet, but they had this uh, blue wallpaper in there. We decided that this room had an opportunity to really enhance. So the biggest thing that we did was, uh, this is uh, my friend, Mr. Joe Batchelor from Evergreen Architectural Arts. Evergreen's done the paint in over 30 state capitals. 
And uh, we did a hand-painted ceiling and all these hand-painted urns throughout the blue room to really enhance that space. This is a house chamber. You can see the before and after. One of the things is that the Capitol has never really been properly painted before. And so with Evergreen's expertise, we were able to come and paint the ornamental plaster in a way that really, all those details really jump out at you. And so you can see before and after here the ceiling and before and after here the chamber. Senate Members Lounge, uh, once again, one of the things that we wanted to do, red is the a primary color for the Senate. So we brought in new rug, we painted the ceiling in the ornamental way that we've been painting the rest of the building. Probably the biggest change in, the, in, the cha in this uh, members lounge though is this was what I would classify as like a Home Depot chandelier. Uh, and we were able to uh, fashion a new chandelier that's not original to the building but is to the time period. And so we were able to create something that's much more regal and fits the space. The fourth floor rotunda, you can see the before and after here of what the fourth floor rotunda looks like. One of the biggest changes we made in here is you can see here the paintings hanging, hanging there. They had walled off those original niches. We restored those back. The paintings are going to come back, but they're going to be suspended in the space now, and they're going to be beautiful. The other thing we did is what we called an ashlar paint pattern to mimic limestone. Because those walls were originally supposed to be limestone, we wanted to create that effect, and you can see that on the walls throughout the building. We created a new ground floor rotunda. Uh, once again, we wanted to connect the rotunda up with the rest of the building, and so we were able to uh, cut a hole in the floor and see where we were going to do that right here and right here, and now we've created a new rotunda on the ground floor, and we fashioned this brand new bronze state seal that was done by the Crucible Foundry in Norman, uh, just like the Guardian statue on the top of the building. Visitor entrance, uh, once again, uh, the main entrance couldn't be used anymore because of ADA. So we created a new, bit, new entrance, but we didn't build anything up that would obscure the historic profile of the building. So we went down and we created this. So as you're standing in the parking lot, you can't even tell that this is there. It's very subtle. And now as you walk up to the building, you have a new front door. Because they weren't using that main entrance anymore, they were able to, um, uh, Steve Mason, who was the chair of my oversight committee, compared coming into the Capitol as, uh, uh, because you had to come in a side entrance, he said it's like coming in through the garage to your friend's house. Now we have a proper front door to the building. And of course, this is our beautiful new State Capitol Museum that I've talked about, so I'll go ahead and uh, let that go, but I do encourage you to go check that out. Uh, we found some interesting things all the way along the way. So uh, these are things we found above ceilings, behind walls. I particularly like the Schlitz beer can from the 1950s that we found in there. Somebody had a good day on the job at one point. This is one of my favorite things. This is an article dated uh, from March 30th, 1917. You can see the headline, Germans Torpedo Another. This was about seven days before the United States entered World War I. I love that clip. This is where a worker signed a piece of aluminum ducting, Milky Way wrapper from the 40s, cigarette wrappers from the 50s, all kind of neat things, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention that I've got a book coming up on the state capitol, and it's going to be coming out on August the 1st of this year, and so you'll be able to find that here at the History Center and a few other bookstores around, but I've had a good time working on this new book. You're going to see a lot of photos uh, from the history of the Capitol. And we've, we've mined our archives here at the Historical Society to publish some photos that, uh, that many people haven't seen in years and years and years. So with that, I think that I have eclipsed my time. I'll be around for questions if you want to ask any questions later. But thank you for uh, giving me some time to talk today. <laughs>